Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. This is the House of Law and I'm Attorney Al Jamran. I'm happy to bring you a new video and in this video we will answer bar questions on loans. And uh, this is my second answering bar questions type of video. The first one was answering questions on lease. Now if you've missed that video, you can watch it again. I will post the link right above here. And also several weeks ago, I made a video on sales mastery. It was like a quiz, and uh, of course, I answered the questions. So you can also check that out. Again, I will put the link here. Both links to those videos will be placed also in the description box below. Now, I believe these exercises are good because at least we have, we will see uh, or have an idea as to how these laws are applied to actual situations. So if you can, um, take time also to check out these videos. Of course, there's no substitute for really studying the substance of the law. But, you know, um, concepts are just concepts. They're just theories. So it's best that you apply them to practical situations. All right. So in this video, I check for questions on loans. And uh, if you will remember, um, I had a video on loans. It was a lecture video. It was quite a long video, but it covered the entire topic or subject on loans, um, including commodatum and mutuum. So that's what I did. Um, I checked for questions on commodatum or mutuum within the range of uh, this um, bar examinations. So the range of the questions uh, for this video is from 2009 to 2019. So that's virtually 10 bar examination years. Okay, now if you want to review loans, the lecture uh, before answering or watching this video, you can also check the video on loans right up here. All right, so if you're ready, let's begin. This is answering bar questions on loans. <music> All right, so let's begin with the 2009 bar. Now, there was a question involving a loan in the factual situation, but the issue was more about the validity of the pledge. We will not answer it now, but instead we will answer it in a separate video on answering bar questions on mortgages and other security contracts. So watch out for that. But uh, definitely I will first make a lecture video on mortgages and other security contracts so that you'll have some you know, basis or some background before we answer the bar questions on mortgages and other security contracts. All right, so let's now go to the following year, the 2010 bar examinations. Unfortunately, there was no question on loans. Now, I can only speculate why there were no questions on loans. Well, usually, um, an examiner provides or gives almost a hundred if not more than a hundred questions on the entire bar examination subject so let's say civil law so like more than 100 or at least 100 questions but um it's still the chairman of the committee who chooses the final cut so i think there were uh, loan questions but then none of the loan questions made it to the final cut so anyway let's now go to the 2011 bar. So here there were three questions with a loan in their factual situations, but one question is about subrogation while the other question was about solidary obligations. Now I will not answer those questions here. Instead, I will reserve those questions for a separate video on answering bar questions on obligations and contracts. Now, I have already made a lecture video. Actually, it was a two-part uh, video. First video was on obligations, and the second video was on contracts. So if you want, you can, uh, in the meantime, watch those videos, but um, expect an answering bar questions video on obligations and contracts. So I will uh, post the link uh, to those two videos on obligations and contracts in the description box below. All right. So. Uh, there was 
one remaining question in the 2011 bar which was appropriate and very relevant to the subject of loans. So the question was this. X borrowed money from a bank secured by a mortgage on the land of Y, his close friend. When the loan matured, Y offered to pay the bank, but it refused since Y was not the borrower. Is the bank's action correct? The choices are A, yes, since X, the true borrower, did not give his consent to Y's offer to pay. B, no, since anybody can discharge X's obligation to his benefit. C, no, since Y, the owner of the collateral, has an interest in the payment of the obligation. And D, yes, since it was X who has an obligation to the bank. So the answer, the correct answer is C. No, since Y, the owner of the collateral, has an interest in the payment of the obligation. Remember Article 1236 of the Civil Code, which provides that the creditor may accept payment from a third person who has an interest in the fulfillment of the obligation. Here, being the owner of the collateral, Y has an interest in the payment of the loans in order to protect and preserve the collateral, which is his property. All right, let's now go to the next year, the 2012 bar. Now, there were two questions on loans. So the first question on loans was this. The borrower in a contract of loan or mutuum must pay interest to the lender. Choices. A if there is an agreement in writing to the effect, B, as a matter of course, C, if the amount borrowed is very large, or D, if the lender so demands at the maturity date. So what's the answer? The correct answer is A, if there is an agreement in writing to the effect. Remember Article 1956 of the Civil Code, which provides that interest shall be due only if it has been expressly stipulated in writing. All right, the next question was, Sigaan granted a loan to Villanueva in the amount of 540,000 pesos. Such agreement was not reduced to writing. Sigaan demanded interest, which was paid by Villanueva in cash and checks. The total amount Villanueva paid accumulated to 1,200,000 pesos. Upon advice of her lawyer, Villeneuve demanded for the return of the excess amount of 660,000 pesos, which was ignored by Sigaan. So the first question is, is the payment of interest valid? Explain. And the second question, or the second sub-question is, is solution in debity applicable? Explain. The answer, for the first sub-question, the payment of interest is invalid because it was not in writing. Again, Article 1956 of the Civil Code provides that interest shall be due only if it has been expressly stipulated in writing. To the second question or to the second sub-question, the answer is yes, solution in debity applies and Villanueva is entitled to a refund of the interest which was paid without basis. Remember Article 2154 of the Civil Code, which provides that if something is received when there is no right to demand it and it was unduly delivered through mistake, the obligation to return it arises. Okay, so now let's go to the next question. The 2013 bar examination had two questions on loans. So first, Lito obtained a loan of 1 million pesos from Ferdi, payable within one year. To secure payment, Lito executed a shuttle mortgage on a Toyota Avanza and a real estate mortgage on a 200 square meter piece of property. A. Would it be legally significant from the point of view of validity and enforceability if the loan and the mortgages were in public? or private instruments. Next question. Lito's failure to pay led to the extrajudicial foreclosure of the mortgaged real property. Within a year from foreclosure, Lito tendered a manager's check to Ferdi 
to redeem the property. Ferdy refused to accept payment on the ground that he wanted payment in cash. The check does not qualify as legal tender and does not include the interest payment. Is Ferdy's refusal justified? Okay, what's the answer? For letter A, as far as the loan is concerned, the form is not a requirement. Remember that in a number of decisions of the Supreme Court, including Tan versus Villa Paz, a contract of loan is binding even if it is not reduced in writing. It is a different situation, however, when it comes to the mortgage. A mortgage is a security contract. It is a special promise to answer for the debt, default, or miscarriage of another. To be enforceable, it must be in writing pursuant to Article 14.03.2b of the Civil Code, the Statute of Frauds. All right. For letter B, Lito's offer to redeem the property with a manager's check should be accepted by Ferdi. As held in Fortunado versus Court of Appeals, a check may be used for the exercise of the right of redemption, the same being a right and not an obligation. The tender of a check is sufficient to compel redemption, but is not in itself a payment that relieves the redemptioner from his liability to pay the redemption price. All right, nice, nice, nice case. This is Fortunado versus Court of Appeals. By the way, trivia, this was penned by the late Isagani Cruz. Okay, next. Second question on loans is this. And this time, it is on Comodatum. Cruz lent Jose his car until Jose finished his bar exams. Soon after Cruz delivered the car, Jose brought it to Mitsubishi Kubao for maintenance checkup and incurred costs of 8,000 pesos. Seeing the car's peeling and faded paint, Jose also had the car repainted for 10,000 pesos. Answer the two questions below based on these common facts. Okay, first, after the bar exams, Cruz asked for the return of his car. Jose said he would return it as soon as Cruz has reimbursed him for the car maintenance and repainting costs of 18,000 pesos. Is Jose's refusal justified? Let's look at the choices. A. No. Jose's refusal is not justified. In this kind of contract, Jose is obliged to pay for all the expenses incurred for the preservation of the thing loaned. B. Yes, Jose's refusal is justified. He is obliged to pay for all the ordinary and extraordinary expenses, but subject to reimbursement from Cruz. Letter C. Jose. Yes, Jose's refusal is justified. The principle of unjust enrichment warrants reimbursement of Jose's expenses. D. No, Jose's refusal is not justified. The expenses he incurred are useful for the preservation of the thing loaned. It is Jose's obligation to shoulder these useful expenses. All right, which of these statements is correct? Or which? would justify the refusal of Jose to return the car despite the demand of Cruz. Is it A, is it B, C, or D? So what's the correct answer? The correct answer is A, Jose's refusal to return the thing is not justified. Jose is obliged to pay for all the expenses incurred for the preservation of the thing. The maintenance checkup and repainting because of peeling and faded paint, those are ordinary expenses for the preservation of the thing. Moreover, the right of the bailey to retain the thing arises only when he has a claim for damages due to hidden defects or flaws of the thing loaned. Now, there was a very confusing choice in that question. I don't know if you've noticed, so let me go back to the previous uh, screen. So, look at the choices. The confusing choice here is letter B because when you read it, at first, this it, it appears to be correct because, yeah, some of these expenses 
are subject to reimbursement. But what makes this choice a wrong answer is the inclusion of extraordinary expenses in the statement, as if suggesting that Cruz is also liable to reimburse Jose for the extraordinary expenses. First, there was no statement in the problem that extraordinary expenses were incurred by Jose. And second, the bailor, meaning to say Cruz, is not liable to reimburse the extraordinary expenses. Only the ordinary expenses for the preservation of the thing may be reimbursed by the bailor. All right, so that's why B is not the correct answer here. All right, so let's now go to the next question, still under the 2013 bar. So the question is, during the bar exam month, Jose lent the car to his girlfriend, Jolie, who parked the car at the Mall of Asia's open parking lot with the ignition key inside the car. Car thieves broke into the car and took it. Is Jose liable to cruise for the loss of the car due to Jolie's negligence? Let's look at the choices. A. No, Jose is not liable to cruise as the loss was not due to his fault or negligence. B. No, Jose is not liable to cruise. In the absence of any prohibition, Jose could lend the car to Jolie. Since the loss was due to force majeure, neither Jose nor Jolie is liable. And C. Uh, yes, Jose is liable to Cruz. Since Jose lent the car to Jolie without Cruz's consent, Jose must bear the consequent loss of the car. And D, Jose is liable to Cruz. The contract between them is personal in nature. Jose can neither lend nor lease the car to a third person. What's the answer? The correct answer is D. Yes, Jose is liable to Cruz. The contract between them is personal in nature. Jose can neither lend nor lease the car to a third person. Remember that in the absence of stipulation, the only persons who are allowed to use the thing borrowed are the Bailey and the members of the Bailey's household. Jolie here is not a member of Jose's household. She was just Jose's girlfriend. No? So that's why um, the act of Jose Lending the car to Jolie without the consent of uh, Cruz okay, violates the personal nature of the contract of Comodatum. All right, so the correct answer is D. All right, let's go now to the 2014 bar. There is only one question in which the factual situation involved alone, but the question is more about mortgage. So again, we will not answer it here. But instead, we will reserve that for the video on answering bar questions on mortgages and other security contracts. So let's now go to the 2015 bar. There is one question in which the factual situation involved a loan, but the question is more about a sale of property. The loan simply being mentioned in the problem as the means to finance or pay the purchase price. So technically speaking, there is no question on loans in the 2015 bar exam. All right, 2016 bar, let's get it on. With regard to an award of interest in the concept of actual and compensatory damages, please state the guidelines regarding the manner of computing legal interest in the following situations. A, when the obligation is breached, and it consists in the payment of a sum of money, like a loan or forbearance of money. And B, when the obligation does not constitute a loan or forbearance of money. Okay. Now, the interest rates on obligations and damages have been prescribed by BSP MB Circular Number 799 back in 2013 as explained also in Nakar versus Gallery Frames decided by the Supreme Court. Thus, the answers to the previous questions are as follows. A, when the obligation is breached and it consists in the payment of a sum of money, that is, a loan or forbearance of money, the interest due should be that which may have been stipulated in writing. Furthermore, the interest due shall itself earn legal interest from the time it is judicially demanded. 
In the absence of stipulation, the rate of interest shall be 6% per annum to be computed from default, that is, from judicial or extrajudicial demand under and subject to the provisions of Article 1169 of the Civil Code. All right. Now, for letter B, when an obligation not constituting a loan or forbearance of money is breached, an interest on the amount of damages awarded may be imposed at the discretion of the court at the rate of 6% per annum. Furthermore, when the judgment of the court awarding a sum of money becomes final and executory, the rate of legal interest, whether the case falls under paragraph 1 or paragraph 2 above, shall be 6% per annum from such finality until its satisfaction. This interim period being deemed to be, by then, an equivalent to a forbearance of credit. All right. Okay, so if you remember, uh, prior to this circular number 799 of the central bank, the rate the rates were different. Now, in some cases, it was 6%, and uh, in other cases, it was 12%. So now it's uniform. When we speak of legal interest, it's just 6%. Okay. All right, now let's go to the 2017 bar. There were two questions in which the factual situation involved a loan, but one question is about an obligation with a period, while the other question was about a guarantee contract. Thus, they were not related or they were not solely or more about loans. So we will answer these questions in the video on answering questions on obligations and contracts and the video on answering bar questions on mortgages and other security contracts respectively. All right, so let's now go to the following year. The 2018 bar unfortunately did not have questions on loans. Okay, another speculation. Maybe uh, it wasn't uh, the strength of the examiner or maybe the chairman wanted to test the examinees more on other subjects or topics under the civil code, which, you know, wild guess is that uh, the chairman wanted to test the knowledge of the examinees on the family code. Usually, naman mas marami ang mga tanong sa family code eh. Pero yun nga, you study the entire civil code kasi ang coverage is from cover to cover nga. Nandun nga sa syllabus. Tapos hindi rin pala magtatanong on this topic. Sayang. But anyway, yeah. So let's now go to the 2019 bar. There was only one question involving a loan in the factual situation, but the question is about extinguishment of the obligation. Hindi pa talaga about loans. So... We will not answer it here. Instead, we will answer that in the video on answering questions on obligations and contracts. All right. So, ano, bitin? Don't worry. Just stay tuned. More videos on answering bar questions coming up. Well, in the meantime, hanggang dito na lang muna. Please hit the like button if you found this video helpful. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed yet. And please click that notification bell so that you will be alerted in case I upload a new video. So until next time, laging tatandaan, isip ay buksan, alamin ang batas.